I come from the development sector, so I'm talking something about that subject. Chairing the, ch chairing the ch child, uh, child Welfare Committee, a bench of magistrates under the Juvenile Justice Act, the final authority for the care, protection, treatment, and rehabilitation of children in need of care and protection. A boy walked in front of me, head hanging, trembling, and really malnourished. I had read his file. It said it all. The last 24 hours had turned his world upside down. Coming back from school, he walked into his one-room tenement called home. He saw his father raise his hand with a machet, and his un unarmed mother just silenced him. She picked up a crowbar nearby, which was within eye shot distance, and the man just fell in a pool of blood. The neighbors rushed in. The police arrived, took the mother into custody, sent the father, took, sent the father for post-mortem, his body, and poor Rakesh, all of 17 years, 16, 15, 16 years, was moved into a children's home, into all that was familiar. Nothing was familiar to him. And he sunk into solitary depression. Estrangement from his mother, who was taken to jail, of course, took a heavy toll on his emotions. Passing an order for mental health support for Rakesh, we also asked him to get in touch with caring next of kin. And we observed over time that this, this young boy slowly came into his own. He started showing interest in studies, and he had to go through the rigors of the criminal justice system. Imagine standing there as a prime lone witness of this murder trial. And somehow, he completed his schooling the next year. Uh, a caseworker tried to distract him by introducing him to art, and suddenly discovered that this young man was talented. He had an incredible talent for art. So they decided, then they asked him to write an entrance exam for a five-year course after school. He, he, he wrote the exam and he succeeded. Now what next to do with him? The course was expensive, five years of art study. And, and after 21, when the government says that you can't stay in our care anymore, so what, where does he go? Fortunately, again, well-wishers came together each one pledged to pay for his fees for one year. Another group of people came forward and said that we will pay for the art, art supplies. We will pay for his transportation. And I insisted that somebody also pays for his pocket money, because Rakesh cannot go to college with no money in his pocket. He, when he wants to have a coffee, he wants to just chat with some friends. Here goes this orphan boy. Mother is in jail. Fortunately for us, Rakesh succeeded. He cleared his. Uh, five-year course, and he got himself a job. And then the entrepreneurship bug bit him, and he started his own studio. He established contact with his mother, who was then released from jail and was working as a domestic help, and then life began blooming for him. Another case that came before the Child Welfare Committee, again a judicial body, this judicial body was frail, 17-year-old Shakila a sex worker, heavily pregnant. Opening a file, what did we see? The police had picked her up from the commercial, busy commercial area. Her mother, a brothel owner, had abandoned her, had thrown her out of the house because she was of no use to her anymore. Where did she find her? She found Shakila abandoned in a government hospital, picked her up, took her home, Neither gave her education, neither gave her any training for any vocational training, but groomed her for the oldest profession in this world. But Shakila was fearless. She came before the committee, five of us sitting down there, and she said, I, I, want, to make, I want to change. So we said, will you, ad, admit, will you get admitted into a shelter home? She said, fine. It was a struggle. Regimental routine of the children of a, of a shelter home is not easy for a girl who has you know, lived freely out in society. She really was very stoic. But she had bouts and bouts of hatred towards her own body. The violations that her body had borne, the bruises that it was carrying, she hated her body. But over time, Shakila, upright, mature, well beyond her years, somehow completed, said that, I want my izzat back. This is what she told us. I want my izzat. I want my honor back. I want society to know that 
I am a good person. I can be a good mother too. Fortunately for her again, a volunteer took to her in spite of knowing her background, helped her to complete her education, helped, took her, her and her child sometimes occasionally for outings, and discovered again in Shakila that she was interested in beauty care. Put her to a training in beauty care, cosmetology, and there she was. She became a budding beautician. She runs her own little uh, beauty parlor, and her son is now in an English medium school. That was her achievement. <laughs> These are not isolated cases. Hundreds of such cases come before child welfare committees and other statutory bodies where we look into the cases of children in need of care and protection. These children are just not different from any of us. They, they are, these stories are also not out of fiction books. They are real life case studies. Faced with socioeconomic deprivation, no access to education, no access to opportunities to change, these children just, you know, they're broken. They tread on literally landmines, landmines, I mean, roads laced with landmines. They don't know where their future is. And all of them are connected through a string of poverty. Exclusion, isolation, poverty, poverty literature and reality are two distant posts. We may fantasize poverty, but how many of us really know what it is to go to bed with a growling stomach, gulping up, dousing it with gulps of water, or just like the Nirbhaya boy whom I had met, he was talking about the Nirbhaya case, that, that boy, I met him. I met him when he was in the, in the children's home, in the observation home. And his mother used to just give a drops of you know, sugar to salivate, to keep that monster hunger, hunger away. How many of us remember coming back from school or work, you know, so hungry, so famished, irritable, unless we had a full stomach? Seeing this deep, you know, deep disturbance in society, so much a difference. What is this growing disparity between us and what is the good fortune that we have? What is the good fortune that you have to stand, sit down here and enjoy the so many, so many privileges in life? Isn't it just a quirk of fate that we are born where we are? I think the most complex algorithms will not explain this puzzle and the answer of what is our good fortune to be able to sit down here, to stand here today and listen to this. Searching for answers, I often turn to elders to tell me, relating story after story, trying to calm the agit soothe the agitated mind. Mother would, matter of fact, say, it's a karma. They're just sowing what they reaped. What can you do about it? Adding to the confusion. Father, a bureaucrat, very diplomatic, would say, I would not want to confront mother and her proclamations, maybe for marital harmony. So he would just add, mother would say, father would say, do your best and leave the rest. Social anomalies cannot be corrected overnight. He would also say, he quoting from the Gita, he would say, experience, enjoy the experience without any expectations. Easy to be, easy to say. And then he would end with this Hindi and uh, Transcript and Pali word saying mudita, mudita, meaning joy. The pleasure that, the, you know, the, the sympathetic and vicarious pleasure that comes from delighting in others' well-being. Do your best and leave the rest. Mudita, mudita is which, with so many caring individuals in society, take on the responsibility to add that spark, that add that, you know, hope in children like Rakesh and Shakila, so that they have a, so that they, they can dream, they, they can triumph over adversities. It is, it, is, it, it is with this that many, many mentors, many, many individuals have come forward, a line of them, sometimes acting as guides, sometimes acting as counselors. They come into the lives, open the doors, open the doors of these children's lives, these youth lives, and tell them how, guide them, give them contacts, links, Tell them how, how, how can they, uh, you know, give them a pat on the back for even an inch of success. Then they also try to sh tell them, give them, you know, uh, try to give them insights into their own life and the power to create and change their own lives. And in the process, 
dissolve that sorrow, that helplessness that these children in society face and help them to find happiness, self-respect and move on. So do your best and leave the rest is what many of these mentors do. Lot of you, the, there are countless Rakeshas and Shakilas in our, in our society. Look in the immediate neighborhood. Look, look at your study place. Look at your work area. All able-bodied young men and women who want to work, who want to lead a life as enjoyable, as fulfilling as your own. They don't want to be left behind. No opportunities. Neither the government, the government, neither, neither access to mental health support, neither these, op these monopolistic governments, inept governments are not able to give them social security measures, their families are not able to support them, and they're fighting poverty. This is what happens to many children across our country. You and I may not know them. You might see them on the street. They are visible to you, but collectively we are indifferent to them. What are their life stories? Why are they here? Can anybody just hold their hand and take them along? It's not possible. A, a, a significant step that one can do to want to make a change in their life is just notice them, first of all. They exist. They notice them. Engage with them. Use your positivity and your passion to bring to allow them to see another way of life. The same kind of passion that an artist, a professional, a professional software engineer, or anyone as a musician, the same kind of passion that he puts to achieve you know, new success, can we add that? The key mantra is, of course, to stay in the long run. Hold his hand, because sometimes he may falter. Sometimes it requires hand-holding. Change doesn't happen overnight, as you all know. It's not instant gratification. You message your girlfriend or you message your friend and you're expecting an immediate response. That doesn't happen. Mentoring, it takes time. It takes a process. So this is what, friends, I'm trying to tell you. That what can, how, how can we change? Youth, for youth. many of you are still young. You've got all these privileges and opportunities. And how can you come together and make a difference to a lot of children's, a lot of youth's life? and lead them on the path and make a difference. When I was at the valid, at a validatory function where I passed out of, it was, very, it was a ritual. It became a ritual for us to walk out with a lamp lit. And, this, and we had to say, and symbolizing what education really meant, lighted to lighten. So this has been more than true in my own life. Lighting a spark in another exudes a fulfilling warmth, you know, a kind of inner peace. And I often refer to that inner peace, asking people, ask me, what is that inner peace that you get? I tell them it's equivalent to a nasha, an intoxication, kind of happiness when you see somebody else happy and going on in life. And I think <laughs> this kind of nasha can be yours too if you take to mentoring to help somebody who's not so privileged and so fortunate as yourself. Never, these, this is the same kind of nasha that I think an alcoholic hankers after. Never mind if these wine shops are closed. We can get this new nisha, nasha. I think what also mentoring does, it creates ripples of goodwill everywhere. It encourages others to come into the movement, a movement that can grow exponentially so that we don't have such an inequitable society. Everyone enjoys, everyone has a fulfilling life. There is a Chinese, uh, I also recollect uh, an interview that uh, was done with uh, Kalam, uh, President Kalam, and they said, what is the secret of your being so exuberant, so enthusiastic, so happy? He said, just, I just try, whenever I see someone, whether it's a child, an old person, I just want to give, I just want to give, I want to give and make happiness. So the Swamiji who was interviewing him said, but life is not like that today. The world doesn't teach us to give, give. The world teaches us to take, take. Give and take, give and take. I mean, nobody wants to just give, give, and see the happiness in the others. There's also a Chinese saying I came across. which said, if you want happiness for an hour, take a good nap. If you want happiness for a day, go fishing. If you want happiness for a year, inherit some fortune and live on that. But if you, want inherit, if you want happiness for a lifetime, help somebody.
for centuries, great thinkers of our, of our country, of the world, have said the same thing. You can find happiness in helping others. So this is what I'm trying to say, that discover yourself. Youth mentor another youth. When you mentor another youth, you will not only discover society, you will discover yourself. One self is discovered by helping others. Thank you.